one of the most underrated blessings is leaving your house and making it back home every single day. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's an underrated blessing that we just assume it's going to happen. And every single day, cats leave the crib and they don't make it back to their children. They don't make it back to their spouses. But we leave our house every single day. We just assume, like, man, I'm going to make it back. I'll see you later. Right? And it's like, man, who promised you that? If you have a piece of crack cocaine, no bigger than this quarter that I'm holding in my hand, one quarter of one dollar, we passed a law through the leadership of Senator Thurman and myself and others, a law that says, if you're caught with that, you go to jail for five years. You get no probation, you get nothing other than Five years in jail. They robbed and hit Jimmy. Jimmy Murray shot him three times in the head and neck, took his bricks of cocaine, some cash, and according to the Washington Post, left his body upside down in the passenger seat of his new BMW. His partner wanted answers. Nah, correction, his partner wanted blood. This is the story of Javier Giovanni Card, AKA Panama, and a multi-million dollar criminal enterprise in the district that led to a war breaking out, contributing to the city's already high murder rate. Ride with me. When you come from the inner cities of America, what you see is what you get. Some guys feel like they only had a block to look forward to. But for people like Javier, who come from a place called Santa Cruz, which is in the city of Panama, the idea of the American dream was sold to many of the people living over there in poverty. Okay, so my name is Javier Giovanni Card. So, traditionally, before the plans of me coming to the United States on this time, I came a few times with my mother as a child on some, you know, vacational type trips. And my memories of that were that, you know, the United States is this like one of the best place, places on earth, you know. But Javier was once an honor roll student who had a mother that made sure he was well taken care of. It was the influence that later came from guys in the community, and specifically the ones who made it to America hitting the ground running, making their ends in the underworld, sending pictures back home, bragging about the endless opportunities in the U.S. This was the 1980s. Manuel Noriega was the dictator in Panama, and Noriega wasn't so innocent himself. At one point, he was receiving money from the drug cartels to allow drugs to flow through Panama, and at the same time, Noriega was also helping the United States as far as giving information about those same cartels, providing intel, playing both sides, taking money from the cartel while on the payroll of the CIA. It was a mess. Even law enforcement in Panama was able to get away with shooting unarmed criminals on the streets. Javier was seeing this with his own eyes. In Panama, the government has green light to shoot you for committing crimes even if you're unarmed. It's not the type of system like up here, for example, where an unarmed person gets shot by the police, you know, people march and there's this big thing going on. Down there, it was like an unofficial rule that police officers had green lights to shoot you if they catch you in the commission of a crime as, as a kid. They had a, for example, they had a rule where if you were if they, you were known to be a juvenile, they were allowed to shoot you below the waist if they caught you in the commission of a crime. But once you turn 18, they would come around sometimes and say, hey, you turn 18, I know you just had a birthday, you know what's up now, right? I'm gonna shoot you in your back or I'm gonna shoot you in your head when I catch you. And I think it got to that point where I said to myself, you know what, because I realized that I wasn't going to stop doing what I, was going to, what I was doing. I felt like I didn't want to die that way, and uh, this might sound insane, so I chose to come up here to get into this thing up here, which, is, which was way more deeper, right? A 
Eventually, with the help of a well-known coke smuggler and mentor named Julio Jack Guerrero, better known as Julito, he would make his way into the U.S. to stay by age 21. Learning under Julito and his La Banda crew in the housing project in New York, Javier caught on quick, making thousands of dollars a day under Julito. Holding his own with big guns when they faced issues with those who didn't like the idea of Panamanian dealers moving in. Javier met violence with violence. He had those exceptional qualities that pushed him to the top. Heart, intelligence, and his ability to lead others. He moved on to running his own operation in the streets and brought his own people to back him, his own crew. Forever grateful to his mentor, Javier proved to be the real deal. But even with his heart, Brooklyn, New York was still a hot zone, which meant anything could happen at any moment. The streets was unpredictable like that. By 88, Javier would be forced to take flight after a Brooklyn dance club was sprayed with lots of rounds, ultimately resulting in a woman named Elsa losing her life. She was a former girlfriend of Javier. Allegedly, Javier opened fire inside the club. He then left New York and made his way to Philly, picking up right where he left off. Only this time, Javier would pick up some more recruits. Some of those guys would later end up in the district with Javier, like his good man Jerome, a.k.a. Ron. Around this time, Julito was trafficking in PG County, Maryland with his La Banda gang. According to Assistant U.S. Attorney Paul Howes, Javier and his crew laid quite a few people down starting in New York. He also stated that Javier got his D.C. connect, Jimmy Murray, from his mentor. By 1990, Julito ended up returning to New York to serve some jail time for probation violation. At the same time, Javier made his way to D.C. to stay. Javier and Jimmy became more than just business partners. They were like brothers. Together they ran an operation in Southeast on MLK using a deli den owned by Jimmy's mother as the headquarters. Authorities said that they had several stash houses and they was raking in a lot of cash, selling coke, moving bricks, estimated net worth at a million a month. One of their spots was on South Capitol Street. That same apartment would play a major role later. Jimmy was in a relationship with a DC cop named Fonda Moore. Because of their relationship, it put Javier and Jimmy in a great position to stay ahead of the game, if you know what I mean. Playing the game at the level of Javier and Jimmy, you had to be shot 24-7. The street's unpredictability could cause you to lose your life or your whole operation. A stash house in Southeast allegedly belonging to associates of Javier was robbed by a couple of street hustlers. A week later, one of the robbers was found murdered and left with handcuffs on in the middle of Montello Avenue in Northeast. About a month later, Javier's partner and friend Jimmy was robbed for some bricks of cocaine and about 40K. His body was left in a BMW upside down in a passenger seat. This was a major hit to Javier. He was tore up over Jimmy's murder. Word got back that a man named Billy Ray Tobert was one of the two guys suspected of robbing and killing Jimmy. Javier, Rome, and others didn't waste any time finding Billy and bringing him to the apartment on South Capitol Street. According to court records, they tied him up, gagged him, beat him, and then he was shot and killed on Javier's orders. Ex-DC cop Fonda allegedly patrolled the block of South Capitol Street while Toba was being murdered. And the killings continued. Michael Gathis was hit on Christmas Day, 1990, outside his apartment on Willow Road in Southeast. He was cornered by two males toting a 9mm and a rifle. They opened fire on him. He didn't make it. John Moore, which was once a member of La Banda, was allegedly one of the shooters. 
He was arrested for the murder after a raid. Then he was released by a judge a day later, and not long after that, just over a week later, John Moore's body was found in Fort Greville Park. He was shot in the head, execution style. By early 91, Julito was back, back from his New York bid, back in business. Javier's one-time mentor had a plan to take it all. And just one day after John Moore's body was found, a man named Yusuf Battle was killed. And according to law enforcement, Yusuf Battle was as close to Javier as John Moore was to Julito. Yusuf was hit at least 20 times. A message was being sent. Julito and Javier is now at war. DC is the murder capital of the United States at this exact time. Javier held his own since he arrived in the US and now, at this time, he's a man with a lot more resources that learn from the best. A man who lost one of his closest comrades and more, but got no time to dwell on it too long considering the circumstances. In an interview that you can find on GorillaConvict.com, Javier, aka Panama said, Southeast was one of the most intense environments I have ever encountered. Murder was the order of the day along with a side order of buku money. I survived by staying shocked, trusting no one outside the circle, and never allowing fear to cause hesitation. That last line, never allowing fear to cause hesitation, says a lot. This is a man that obviously understands fear is normal. Those without fear are the easiest targets. Like 50 Cent said, if you don't acknowledge fear, you basically ignore potential danger. So as the tension between Javier and Julito reached an all-time high, the unexpected happened. Julito died of a heroin overdose on February 18, 1991. The media claim Javier supplied the batch of heroin that killed him, which he denied to this day. His mentor that started him out in the life of crime, bringing him to the States, was now gone. A few weeks after Julito died, a man named Eric McDowell was heard bragging about the Jimmy robbery and murder. It was said that he was in Burry Farms bragging about how he was able to keep all the money since Tolbert was killed. But on March 7th, he and a friend were shot and killed on Hartford Street in Southeast. Allegedly, it was retaliation for Jimmy. The walls were beginning to close in on Javier, Rome, and the rest of the crew. His associates, as well as Julito's people, decided to become government witnesses after being arrested at different times. They ratted on Javier. Eventually, in May of 91, Javier was tracked down and captured. Although the police connected Javier's name and organization to more than 10 murders, some of them had nothing to do with Javier. He was convicted of a few charges including felony murder while armed and sentenced to 88 years to life. Fonda Moore got up to 8 years for her role in everything. Rice and Rome both got multiple life sentences for kidnapping and murder. It was supposed to be the end for the guys. But after years of fighting hard in prison, Javier, Rice and Rome was able to get an appeal. And because of shady business on the government's behalf, they would eventually see the light of day, giving some of their time back. Javier, Rome, and Rice fought hard, didn't tell, and according to the rules of the streets, they played the game to the end with honor, but not without loss. Yusuf, Jimmy, and plenty more people that are not here today, gone forever as a result of what took place. There's a lesson in every story. Maybe this one will help a troubled soul find their way. My name Jay and I'm out. It's different for me now because now, you know, I'm going on 30 years in prison and I want to go home. So now I look at home and it is a little anxiety now because you know, as bad as I want to be with my mother and he is for her another crying day, I'm also going to a land that has changed in the past three decades, you know? Triple OG status, sipping here, the blend is massive, niggas anti-f***ing, talking reckless.
Cause that shit ain't happening when it come to family Shit is candy cause we ain't candy Got them yappers handy Case the Bama feeling fancy Yeah she call me daddy Feeling randy Hot in her panties Wanna fuck me badly Mouth is me She sucks me manly Bumping Charles Bradley Rest in peace My nigga had me out in Cincinnati Bass booming about the caddy About to fly to Cali Me and Wally In the alley Talking matching alleys Smoking gas in Mexicali For the boss who got it Fuck you niggas Keep talking about me Cause they won't be round me I'm a king, you gotta crown me, stay the fuck around me If you harming or trying to clown me, cause I'm locking proudly Be at your head like a bounty, you gon' know about me Ain't nothing ho about me, you want that feeling out me And I'm replying stoutly, fuck around And it's just a winter, fall back to the summer cup Spring through the rinks, I'm underdog to be in